we're going to dive right into the chemistry of life, I think is what we call it. Molecules of life, chemistry of life. So this, the first lecture really was introduction, getting you started. Now we begin this um, task of going through our review material. And so for the next couple of lectures, we're going to be in review. Oops. Sorry. I don't know what happened. I didn't do anything. I'm my timer on. Okay. So in the lower left, what is that a picture of? Anybody know? My six-year-old said it's a peacock feather. <laughs> you look like a peacock feather? Yeah. yeah. It does, huh? She said it's Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> you guys know what that is? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a good Kevin. <laughs> um, so this is actually a polarizing microscope picture of cholesterol. And what's this up here? Microscope. That's a well. So this is a microscope, and this is cork. Both of you are correct. This is Robert Hooke's compound microscope from the 1600s. Okay, still had to carry it with two hands. Okay. All right. So when Robert Hooke created his compound microscope, we started being able to look at totally new things at the level of the cell. And in the next like three lectures, we get to talk about how all the stuff that you already learned in your prerequisites is actually relevant to this class. It's not like we're mean when you say, you know, you know, blow you up. You know, come see me in like four years if you don't like prerequisites. Okay? We actually want you to have this baseline of material so that you can understand how all these things fit together. Okay, so I know this is gonna be a little painful, but let's try it. How many neutrons does aluminum have? Otherwise known as aluminium. Seriously, this. What's that? 13. So I circled it for you in case you couldn't find it. Okay, just to be helpful. So how many neutrons does it have? 14 neutrons, right? How do you get 14 neutrons? What's the atomic number? Atomic number is 13. What's the atomic mass? 27. And so you take the atomic mass minus the number of protons, which usually have the same number of neutrons, right? And that's going to give you 14. Okay, so the chemistry that we're learning about in pre -read classes is going to play into here because we're going to start talking about some of these compounds. Like, for example, we're going to talk right now about organic versus inorganic. Right? Sorry, I'm boring you over there. Which is the one that's out of place here? Which one is not an organic molecule? Okay? All right, look, wait, don't look at it. Talk amongst yourselves. I want, I want you guys to collaborate on this. Take a little time to think about which one. Talk to your neighbor. Try to convince them you're right if you have different answers. This one is actually non-organic. 
Because this one doesn't have, or the classic definition of organic is it has hydrogenated carbons. And because this is a, two, a double bond of C to the O, there's no room for hydrogen. So oxygen, as well as carbon dioxide, are actually non-organic. Okay? They're inorganic gases. But now, there's always this debate amongst chemists. Is inorganic material more important than organic material? What do you guys think? No. They're equally important. You actually can't have life without both of them. Right? You always hear kind of in high school classes that organic materials are kind of the key to life. They are. But you also need a key hole to put it in type of thing. You need a door. You actually need a lot of other things in order for life to be, to be sustainable. So carbon dioxide as well as oxygen are not organic molecules by definition. But they're critically important. Now, not to throw the organic chemists under the bus, because it's been around for a long time. Organic chemistry has been used for centuries. In fact, 2,500 to 3,000 BC, the Chinese were actually using extracts from herbs to stimulate blood pressure. And they were getting this in a, into a compound that we know as ephedrine. Right? And that is a form of adrenaline. And so it would raise blood pressure in patients that were near death. And ephedrine is an organic compound. And you come over to Western medicine, and your discovery of penicillin. Penicillin was actually discovered by Sir Alexander Fleming in 1928, so much more recent than the Chinese. And the original discovery of penicillin was actually back in the Middle Ages, where they were identifying this mold that was on bread, and then someone decided to try it, I guess, and it was penicillin. And it wasn't until, until Sir Alexander Fleming actually isolated it and investigated it and was able to characterize it as penicillin. Before that, they'd been using this bread mold to treat different types of wounds. Okay, I, don't, I mean, that's a pretty creative idea. Okay, maybe you came out of a pub late at night and you're like, hey, put this in there. Okay? <laughs> but that's experimentation. So organic molecules have been used for thousands of years, and they're very, very important. But so are inorganic materials. Organic materials, they're carbon-based, and that might be why you chose E okay, um, in that last exercise. But really, they're carbon-based, and they're hydrogenated carbons in order for them to be an organic molecule. So the things in this class that are relevant, bless you, are carbohydrates, nucleic acids, lipids, as well as proteins. These are the building blocks of the human body. So understanding what those compounds are will allow you to be able to study them more carefully in the human body. Plus, you can very quickly see that these are compounds that we get straight from our diet. Like, we consume this every day. Carbohydrates, nucleic acids, lipids, and protein. And honestly, you can't sustain life without consuming all four of them. No matter what the diet is that you think you're on. You can't completely eliminate one of them and have a healthy lifestyle. Now, you can't support the organism perpetually that way. It may be great to lose some weight, or it may be great to alter your lifestyle for a period of time. But you can't sustain it. It won't work. And if you think about the extreme is try to eliminate one of those in a child's developmental period of life. You get major, major developmental abnormalities. Okay? Because all the diet stuff we hear about is all, you know, us wealthy Westerners that have food within like six feet of us at any given time. Right? And so we have the luxury of kind of restricting certain things. Inorganic molecules. No, they're not carbon-based and they're not hydrogenated carbons, but they're just as important. Let's talk about a couple of the key ones. <clears throat> like water. It's not organic, but you can't get life without it. Right? Gases, carbon dioxide and oxygen, as well as a lot of key minerals that we're going to talk about, like calcium. And we can look at the different 
atomic architectures of these molecules, and you did that. You did that in high school chemistry, or you did that in uh, freshman chemistry at the university or college, and you looked at the different differences between where these molecules come from. Are we going to spend a lot of energy there? No. Are there going to be sp3 orbitals on, uh, on the first exam? No. Okay. But what I do want you to be able to do is differentiate between organic and inorganic and give me examples. Be able to distinguish and give me examples. And understand kind of this take home point that one's not more important than the other. You actually need all of them. So at the atomic level, the, at the atom is the smallest unit of matter that retains all the properties of that substance. And you learn about that too. This is all review. It's made up of a nucleus. And there are protons and neutrons within that. And then the electrons orbit the outside, just like what we see here. Living material. We talked about the cell being the first place that life shows up. And then we have sort of our own little debate on where the mitochondria sits in there. And we kind of agree that that's not incorrect. But for purposes of this class and for the exam, we want to answer cell, right? But if we look at living things, 96% of all the atoms in the body are made up of four substances. 96% of all the atoms. Oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. The other 4%, um, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur. And this is in a sea of fluid. This is in a aqueous environment. Our body is about 50 to 75% water by composition. Why the big fluctuation? Any ideas? Homeostasis, okay. Give me some examples. Sweating, okay. You just had an exercise for like 20 seconds. Okay, yes, so that might have influenced your hydration levels. Okay. Environment. If it's hot outside. Um, age of the individual. Whether they're an adolescent, whether they're growing, it's a pediatric child. Okay, whether they have a disease state. Maybe they're an elite athlete. Some of you guys that are, you know, heart rates of 52, right? If you just did a race, you may not be up at 75%. Hydration levels can dramatically sway within the human body. Now, if we look at the minerals and gases, they make up about 4% of our body weight, mostly calcium and phosphorus. Other ones include potassium, sodium, chloride, magnesium, and sulfur. Now, what major structure in the body that we're going to study this semester, it was an orange on that slide from Tuesday, what major system is significantly dependent upon mineral composition? Bone. Thank you. Okay, and that's where you store a lot of your bone, that, or a lot of your um, minerals. A lot of your bone mineral in the format of calcium and phosphate, as well as salt, some potassium, lots of magnesium, and a little bit of sulfur. That's stored strategically throughout your entire body, in your skeletal system. So when you go in the lab and you look at the skeletons, don't just think of them as an architecture by which stuff attaches to it's also a depository for all your mineral within your body. Pretty clever, right? You got two for one there. Body structure, enzyme, nucleic acids, and ATP, as well as nerve impulses, are all dependent upon these inorganic minerals. And action potential. We're going to study action potential and how it works. Well, the only way an action potential works, which is basically an electrical signal, right? It's what's allowing you to do this. Right? I don't see anything back yet. It's allowing you to actually, with your erector spinae muscles in your back, sit up straight. And it doesn't fire unless you actually are moving certain minerals, like sodium and potassium. And we're going to study those extremely carefully. 
Coenzymes like iodine and iron. Iron is critically important for the transportation of oxygen. Oxygen in the bloodstream binds to the iron on a hemoglobin molecule. Want to bet that's an example of a test question? So the way I could ask these questions on an exam will be multiple choice style. And give me an example. I give you examples of where you would find inorganic materials within the body. And for example, iron. That's a subtlety that I just brought up. Where do you find iron? You really don't talk about that until 202 when you talk about blood and oxygen transport. But we're covering it right now because it's relevant to where we are. And when you get into 202 next, you'll be that much further ahead. Gases. Oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nitric oxide. I think oxygen is pretty obvious. Can't survive without it. Can't survive without CO2 either. CO2 is a tremendous way that we buffer our acid levels in the body. The pH of the body sits between about 7.35 to 7.45. And it's very tightly controlled. And if you get a pH much outside of that, then the patient can go into shock. Nitric oxide is a compound you probably haven't heard much about. It's made by endothelial cells. It's released from these endothelial cells that line blood vessels, and it actually causes vasodilation of the blood vessel. That allows you to thermoregulate. We just gave that example. That also allows you to grow new blood vessels into new areas, because the way you grow a new blood vessel is you dilate out the original, and then you create a sprout from that dilated vessel. That's how you repair tissue. If you've ever cut your hand, or skinned your knee, or had major surgery, the way the wound closes and heals is because of new blood vessels growing in, bringing in nutrition and removing waste products. So nitric oxide is critical for homeostasis and maintenance of our body. Okay, shifting gears slightly into water. 50 to 75% of us, our composition is made up of water. It must be pretty important. Well, water itself is a phenomenal solvent. That means that's, that's, a, that's a fancy chemistry word for you can dissolve lots of stuff in it. Okay? Dissolve lots of things in water. It's polar. It's hydrophilic. It has an angle of about 105 degrees. It creates partial charges. And that, in of itself, helps to facilitate this beautiful property of solvency. So the polarity, having water-like or uh, polarized ends, a positive and negative end, makes it a wonderful solvent where you could actually dissolve something like a substance into it. So a solute is the substance dissolved in a solvent. And the solvent is the dissolving agent. Right? So solvent plus solute equals the solution. So if you think about, how many of you wear contacts? So if you look at your eye solution, what they call it, that's the correct way to refer to it. Because if you look at the ingredients, the first ingredient is probably the ionized water. Okay? So it's purified water. And then there's probably going to be some percent salt, sodium and chloride. So basically, there might be some antimicrobials in there as well, some antibiotics, right? So that when it's sitting there as a salt water solution, you don't grow stuff in it. And then like squirt it in your eye. Okay? So if we look at these water molecules, remember the hydrogen bonding? The hydrogen bonding is this bond that forms between a hydrogen and an oxygen of different water molecules. This is why those water bugs can walk on the surface of the water. Right? There is a surface tension of the water. It's a weak attraction, a very weak bond. But it's actually very critical. Because what it does is it allows for us to set up barriers and compartmentalize the body. So the body itself is not one giant cell. It's made up of many different cells, right? We're not just an amoeba. <laughs> and we compartmentalize because we can create membranes. And we do that from the very beginning of the development of the embryo. As soon as the egg 
sees the sperm, membranes start separating and division starts taking place. You guys remember that? So from the very beginning, it's so critically important to be able to compartmentalize this organism. And that allows for specialization. You can do certain things in one area and certain things in another. So water itself is an excellent solvent, right? So you have solutes plus the solvent is what a solution is. And oil itself doesn't dissolve well in water. So if we have something that is a lipid, which is an organic molecule, we can drop it into an inorganic solution, like a salt water solution, and we can actually start creating compartments in this aqueous environment. It doesn't dissolve because it's non-charged, and so it's all hydrophobic. There's no positive and negative ends, not charged at all. It's neutral, essentially. And so it's hydrophobic, meaning water-fearing, and it's not going to go into solution. So if you took uh, a glass of water and you put some cooking oil in it, like some Wesson cooking oil, or vegetable oil, or canola oil, and you stirred it up gently, you would see that the oil would form these little droplets. And as it slowed down, they would eventually start forming larger droplets. And if you left it sitting on the countertop overnight, you would get a separation of oil on top and water on the bottom. You just created a compartment. You just created a cell. You created a membrane with an aqueous environment inside. And that's our strategy. That's what we do. Now, we can also use a detergent, and we can break up that oil membrane, and that's you know, what Dawn or palm olive does in your kitchen sink. Um, it actually goes in and simultaneously binds to the oil and to the water, and it has a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic end, so it allows the integration of water and oil to take place, and that's what pushes the oil off the dish plate. What is this molecule on the, on the right side? Phospholipid. Remember this? So we're going to start looking at the phospholipid bilayer in a lecture or two. Again, review. But I want to prove to you why you spend so much energy on this phospholipid bilayer. I want to prove to you that if you don't understand it well, you're going to have a really difficult time with action potentials and how nerve signals happen. Because they use this compartmentalization concept, and they use basically the separation of a lipid in a water environment in order to allow for movement of ions to take place in different levels of concentration. Okay? We're not there yet. You have to trust me, but that's where we're going. That's why you learn about the phospholipid in great detail. And we're going to use it here. But if you're kind of confused, I, don't, I remember the drawings, it's like a lot of circles and like squiggling tails. Can you remember if the tails go together, if the heads go together, or what? Well, we're going to go over it again. But you've got to get these fundamentals, otherwise you're really going to struggle when we start moving ions across them. And we're going to move stuff fast. Okay? All right, another review concept, PAs. So I've talked a lot, let's take a quick break, and you guys talk amongst yourselves. A, person A, what is pH a measure of, and what are buffers for? Oh, wait, sorry. A, uh, what do the numbers mean? B, what is pH? And what are buffers? Ready, go.
Alcohol is acidic, neutral, or basic. Okay? Here's some numbers. Numbers. Alkalinity. So what would be an example of an alkaline number? 13. How about an acidic number? Below 5. Uh, yeah, anything below 6.9 technically. But in the smaller you go, the more acidic it is, right? Like here. Now B. Person B, what, um, what's it actually measure? What's that? Parts of hydrogen per million. Parts of hydrogen per million. So free hydrogen ion, right? Free hydrogen ion that's floating around. It could go do something. So it's actually a representation, if you remember, right here. Here's the formula. pH is the negative logarithmic scale of free hydrogen ion concentration. So logarithmic is kind of like the Richter scale, which is a logarithmic scale. Right, so for example, how many from California? So a 7.0 is significantly bigger than a 6.0. Right? Earthquake. Mm -hmm. Because it's a logarithmic scale. It's not a direct scale. It's not like 6 to 7 is just like 3 to 4 or 4 to 5. So the further up the scale you get, like an 8.0 is much, much larger than the difference between a 6 to a 7. Than a 7 to an 8. Okay? And that's why when they measure it like in a 7.2 versus 7.5, that's actually a big difference. Okay, so when you go on the scale, here's pure water at 7.0, and you can kind of see anything below 7, so 6.9 and down is going to be considered acidic. 7.1 and above is going to be considered to be alkaline. So the blood in our body is slightly alkaline, 7.35 to 7.45. It's very tightly controlled. Most people would say it's 7.4 plus or minus 0.5. But that makes a big difference. It's actually impressive <clears throat> that we can handle such a large fluctuation of our entire body. But if you had someone that presented with blood, and you took a blood test, and you were measuring blood that was like 7.5 or 7.1, you would be really nervous. You'd say, something is not right. That is a big change from what it should be. Make sense? <clears throat> so you can see, in some environments in our body, we have... Uh, a zero, or maybe close to zero. Um, uh, oh no, this is sorry. This is a point nine. I was gonna say I don't think it's zero. One mole of hydrochloric acid would be zero. And the gastric juices, which have hydrochloric acid in them, HCl, our body manufactures it, but it's slightly diluted. And so gastric juice is about 0.9 to 3.0 pH. You can see where uh, wine sits, and bananas, and coffee, and then you can see some really aggressive bases. So pH regulation is critically important in our body, and we spend a lot of energy monitoring it, and adjusting for it. And, I, and I'll allude to 202, but one of the biggest ways that we uh, manage our CO2 level is using this bicarbonate buffer system. So my next question is, what's a buffer? Something that regulates the pH and how it works, whether there's too many hydrogen ions that absorb some hydrogen ions. Okay. And then we'll leave the Perfect. So it's, a buffer is a compound that helps to prevent large swings in free hydrogen ion, whether it's too much or too little. So the buffer would be able to gobble up a lot of free hydrogen ions so that you don't have too much acidity. Or maybe release it and make it available if the blood's too alkaline. And the buffer system that we use in the body is this bicarbonate buffer system. And what that looks like is CO2 is basically the conversion of free hydrogen ion into a gas so that you can exhale it. And you exhale that free hydrogen ion in the form of CO2 as a gas and water. That's the reaction. And you can prove that to yourself if you go up to the mirror and you go, right, you can see the water vapor on the mirror. So you know you're not only exhaling gas, you're exhaling gas and water because that's the byproduct of bicarbonate plus hydrogen ion pushing it over to the other side of the equation, which is free hydrogen ion and water. Okay. 
or excuse me, bicarbonate and free hydrogen ion pushing over to water and CO2, and that's what you breathe out. Okay? So the more hydrogen ion the concentration is higher, the pH value is what? Lower. It's more acidic. So we're talking an awful lot about inorganics, and we're going to enter into this segment of organic substances. And these are things you should be very familiar with. These are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. We'll start it. We won't get through all of them today, but we're going to go ahead and get started. We'll end when we need to end. And we'll pick it up here next. So first up, carbon. What is it? Well, it's a, it's a very stable molecule. It has four covalent bonds, or four opportunities for covalent bonding. It readily binds with other atoms. It's actually rather reactive. And then you can attach to it different functional groups. So you can see five different displays here, you probably remember. Carbon in the middle with four hydrogens on all sides. Same representation, carbon in the middle with four hydrogens on all sides, a three-dimensional model. Carbon in the middle, four hydrogens on all sides. Carbon in the middle, four hydrogens. Carbon in the middle, you get, this is all the same molecule. Okay. Well, you can attach more than hydrogen to it. For example, in the upper right, you can actually attach what? An OH, and you're going to get things that are like sugars and alcohols. So this red O and the blue H, OH is going to be a sugar or an alcohol. If it's a CH3, you can see the black C and the three blue H's. This is a methyl group. That methyl group will be things like fats and oils, amino acids and steroids. A carbox, carboxyl group, the COOH, these are amino acids, sugars, and proteins. An amino terminus, or amino end, an NH3, this, uh, these are amino acids and proteins. Or a phosphate group, right, an H2PO4. And the phosphates are nucleic acids and adenosine triphosphate. Nucleic acids are the building blocks of DNA. So all of these examples over here are obviously pretty critical. Are they very important? Yes. Are they more important than oxygen or CO2? I would say no. They're all equally important. So what carbon likes to do is it likes to form chains. And as it forms chains, we call them macromolecules. These macromolecules can be built into a ring-like structure. And this is the way it likes to organize. It's this ring-like structure. So if it is a single carbon molecule, we'll call it a monomer. Mono meaning one. But you can string them together and make what we call polymers, which are many monomers, right? Poly meaning many. For example, glycogen. Glycogen is a polymer that's a number of chains of glucose that are all strung together. And so glycogen happens to be the storage format of glucose. And you store it in this long chain. And as you need it, you kind of cut off the end. It's like you know a big piece of cheese or a long piece of bread or a salami stick. And you just cut off a little bit at the end as you need that particular food. Polymerization, making polymers, makes sense, right, the word, happens during this process down here known as dehydration synthesis. Why is it called dehydration synthesis? The best way for students to remember this is when you dehydrate something, you take water out, right? Have you ever been backpacking and have like, you know, mashed potatoes and gravy or um, some pot roast in a, in a foil pouch? All the water's been taken out. It was made like three years ago and still good for another 10. Okay? So if you take monomer one and you add it to monomer two, you get a dimer, dimer meaning two, right? And you squeeze out water. This is dehydration synthesis. This is how you would take glucose plus glucose to make a disaccharide. We'll talk about that next. But if you keep these chains,
chains go, you make glycogen. When you want to break the bond, that's going in the reverse direction. And if you take the arrow and you draw an arrow here, which is important to do, I would label that arrow hydrolysis. Hydrolysis is going in the opposite direction, and you add in water into the system. Okay? Have a nice weekend. This is where we'll pick it up on Tuesday.